in Zurich. Well, when, when, we, when we moved to a building on the 17th floor, but, but your 12th floor is totally topping this. Amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about AI and I'm a very interactive speaker. So I would be super happy if you immediately interrupt me every five minutes and I will, I will promise I will not go longer. I have, I have slides for about 15 hours, um, <laughs> but, but I will not go over the 45 minutes that have been allotted. But please interrupt me if there's anything unclear or anything that is... Uh, that is interesting you. Okay, topic today is scalable and efficient artificial intelligence uh, from supercomputers to smartphones. So what does that mean? I mean, uh, AI is quite an interesting field. You've probably seen all of those. At the beginning of the year, um, uh, ChatGPT looks interesting. It could pass some bar exam, but uh, now it can be an MBA. Um, it can also be a, a, your medical doctor. In fact, there was a questionnaire uh, comparing ChatGPT with real doctors, and, and patients preferred ChatGPT over real doctors because it showed more empathy. Um, I'm, I'm not kidding. So, somebody is asking a question? Not, not yet. Not yet. Okay, cool. And then it could also be us, and it could actually make more money than, 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 than us. Uh, so it, as an engineer at Google, but now no, the, the opening joke is kind of what is left for us as humans. So, so what, what, what do we, what makes us human at that point? Because this is all, these are all capabilities that we thought to be very human, um, but now they're all gone. And AI is actually better than the average human in, in pretty much all of those tests, okay? So if you look it up, uh, what's special about humans? Um, what makes you human, basically, or us? Um, there is an article from 2016. Uh, so 2016, AI was not a topic yet to compare to humans. Right? So, so the, the closest, uh, closest form of, of intelligence were chimpanzees. And so the big difference between humans and chimpanzees is if you look at the last one, I think that doesn't work, but if you look at the last one, is that the, the difference is, again, feedback, um, that Humans have theory of mind capabilities, which means uh, we can work on shared goals, which means we can build societies, we can build cities, we can build planets, we can build aircrafts, we can build ship, we can build all kinds of very complicated devices that one single human and computers, one single human would not be able to build. Chimpanzees cannot do that. Um, so now the question is, well, does ChatGPT have theory of mind in the sense? I mean, what is theory of mind? Theory of mind means that we can connect. I can talk to you. I can communicate lots of information to you. And I kind of understand what's going on in your mind at a given moment, because that's the prerequisite to connect to you. Okay, so I'm hoping we have kind of a connection here <laughs> while I'm speaking. So now, unfortunately, um, well, ChatGPT or, or the new Bing, which is basically the same model in the back end, it's, it's GPT-4, uh, also has theory of mind capabilities. In fact, uh, theory of mind capabilities of Bing are uh, better than many autistic humans. So, uh, well, there is another problem here. So what is really left for us as humans? And I'm not quite sure. So that is something we could discuss <laughs> over lunch. So it's really, it's, it's quite interesting. But now, this is a technical talk. Um, I want to go a little bit more into detail. How did we get here? So how did we get to this AI uh, explosion where we are today? And if you actually go back to the um, uh, to Hinton and Lagoon and Bengio, who got the Turing Award uh, 2018, I think mean, that's the um, and and if you look at the talk, um, you hear two interesting comments. So really, the deciding factor for the AI revolution was the increase in compute power. Furthermore, um, a lot of credit for deep learning goes to the people who make computers go fast. So this is actually, you can look this up, this is, I put the, <laughs> the, the video uh, timings there. So really, it is much about compute power, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. In fact, AI is mostly gated by compute power. The capabilities of these systems are just gated by us having enough compute available for the future. Um, actually, this was an interesting thing. I spent my sabbatical in 2019 at Microsoft, and this was exactly when uh, Microsoft made, made this uh, big bet uh, with OpenAI that we are now seeing the fruits of. Um, there's one very interesting quote as well from Greg Brockman. We think the most benefit will go to whoever has the biggest computer. Shortly after, Microsoft announced the billion dollar uh, supercomputer that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, and that was also 2019, yeah, while I was there on sabbatical. So, but now how do we make these computers go fast? Right? This, is, this is the big question. Many of us know because many of us are in the HPC field. It's exactly what the field has been doing for the last couple of years. And in fact, 2021, uh, our Lighthouse member of the field, Jack Gangara, got the Turing Award for uh, his many contributions to uh, paving the way for AI and many other fields moving forward today through his library developments. So 
really supercomputers are super efficient at dense linear algebra. This is why today much of AI bases on dense linear algebra. It's actually pretty funny. Uh, I'm, I myself am convinced that dense linear algebra is not the best way to use AI systems or to implement AI systems. However, it is because these computers are really good at it. Our brains are not doing dense linear algebra. That's pretty clear. However, um, I mean, we can have a technological discussion at the end. So, so keep that for the future. So what does it now mean? Supercomputers fuel modern AI um, systems today. And you can see this because actually supercomputers have never been that sexy in the past. Companies like Facebook or Meta talk about AI supercomputers publicly. Nobody has ever used the term supercomputer in big industry in the uh, before the 2012, let's say. Tesla, a car company, builds a supercomputer. <laughs> so what is going on? Google builds a supercomputer. They were actually for the longest time uh, not considering supercomputers as, as a, a way to run data centers, but now they are, everybody is. And then Microsoft, as I mentioned, a $1 billion pledge to OpenAI, where they built a supercomputer super that even has a comic with the Microsoft CTO in, in front of it. So that, is, that just shows us that supercomputing is at the at the key or at the, the peak of its, its existence or maybe its importance in the past. But what does it now mean? What, what does it now mean to use the supercomputer to train these very large models? So give me about a, I will give you about a 30 second overview of how large scale AI training works. And I can, I can go into arbitrary detail if you want. And so please ask questions if something is unclear. So how does GPT modeling work like GPT-4 that many of you are familiar with? Um, so you take the internet, and, and what you do is, is you just read, there's lots of text on the internet, uh, and then you take, let's say, a page here, and you remove a word, okay? Then you run it through some model that's a transformer model. Um, it's all about attention, and I can, again, go into more detail, but I want to focus on the computational aspects here. We can talk offline or after my talk about the data science aspects, if you want. So that model is really a parameterized function that I call f of x. x is the input with the word removed. What do we ask the function to do? Well, the function is now supposed to predict the word that I just removed. It's actually super simple. I can take a lot of text, I remove words, and I train the function to predict the word that was removed. In GPT style models, typically the last word, but here it's a word in the middle, it doesn't really matter for kind of details. And here you can see um, there are some predictions. And then, of course, it's, it's never 100% correct, but you know which word you've removed from the text. right? So what you now do is you, you adjust these probabilities of the output of the model by going backward and update parametric weights. These are called parameters or weights in the model to when you next time input the same rule word with the, with the input x, um, then you will get a more likely or a higher probability outcome for the word not in this case, right? That's really how machine learning training works. And you do this over millions, if not billions of iterations. <laughs> so you really hammer it into the model. They learn very differently from humans. Right? This is not how we learn, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Thank goodness, yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness, exactly. So, so it's really kind of a very inefficient way of learning, if you think about it. However, it works in practice. So now if you look at the data here, so GPT-3 has been uh, trained with 500 billion tokens. A token is a piece of a word, but, but for the purpose of this talk, just, just remember it's a word, okay? 500 billion tokens. Um, image net images um, is about a couple of terabytes. And actually, today, we are training on the whole internet. Like, what I'm saying today is most likely going to go through a deep neural network for its training um, if Eva publishes it. <laughs> so every single YouTube video is going to feed through those things. Everything we say, if you're using uh, any kind of service that, that does not explicitly exclude them from using <laughs> your data, they will certainly use your data to train these models. Um, so it's a lot. It's a lot, a lot of data that goes through those. Um, then on GPT-3, um, the sp specific structure, it's 96 uh, layers. And I can talk about what the layers is basically this thing here. There are two layers on this, on this image. Um, it has about 175 billion parameters, which is in FP32, 700 gigabyte of parameters. So these little parameters that you train on the back, it's actually a lot of data. Um, and this is the key to the model. This is the holy, this is the secret sauce. Like these parameters are worth gold. Like these are worth uh, tens of millions of dollars, just the 700 gigabyte of data. Um, and uh, the GPT-3 model has a 200, 2,048 tokens. Today, we have many more tokens. So, so we do inference on 16,000 tokens today. And a token is a word. This is how long your text can be, basically. Um, so it's your window of, of visibility. You can also envision a token in GPT is kind of your short-term memory. Uh, so it's very short, it's only 2,000. It's actually your memory, not your short-term memory. It's kind of like part of your memory. But again, we can talk about that later if you want. And then, um, well, it takes weeks to train 
on a very, very large machine. Right? So, so this is really how it works in detail. But now let's talk a little bit more about other use cases. Um, um, this is all going to be the same architecture, by the way. So if you're now in the HPC community, you may not care about ChatGPT. You may care about climate and weather prediction, um, just as an example. Which so, are being killed by, by ChatGPT, is which, the climate part. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is actually a good discussion. So let, let me just quickly, quickly react to this. Um, the, the interesting discussion is that these data centers, they use about 10 to 15 megawatt. Um, I mean, the, the supercomputers, not data centers, more. Um, so these 10 to 15 megawatt, if you Amtrak, how much does an Amtrak engine use? Uh, also 10 megawatt. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can drive with the train with, a, with 200 people through the country, or you can train a model that changes the future of the Earth. So you can decide. Um, we had this discussion in Switzerland. It was quite funny. Uh, when, the, when there was the energy crisis, um, the government came in and, and was looking at everything that used energy. And for the, for the data center, which is in, in that ballpark, they were kind of laughing and saying, well, just turn off one train and it's all good. <laughs> so so it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> But, but of course, if you train uselessly and a lot, then it's, it's bad. Um, so there's this ECMWF, which you may know as the European model uh, from TV, uh, whenever there's a hurricane prediction or something, that's the European model. These are kind of the world's best uh, medium range uh, weather prediction uh, uh, services. It's in Europe. And what they do is they have this IFS, this integrated forecasting system. That's really this, this thing that is so good, giving you a very good prediction of three to seven days. Now, um, artificial intelligence are basically matching, uh, artificial intelligence systems are matching IFS accuracy. This is a system from NVIDIA. There's a Chinese system as well, Pangu Weather, and both of them are more efficient. So how do they do that? They do it pretty much exactly the same way as I just explained. They use transformer networks. They feed in the data a little bit twisted, so, so they use a Fourier basis, so they, they transform the data slightly differently. It's not text. Um, but it's the same thing. So they just feed a lot of data through the model abstractly seen and train this model to just predict the next day of weather in this case, and not necessarily the next word in the sentence. So these models are very, very versatile. In fact, you can, you can tweak them with newer ideas, but that, that's a technical detail that I don't want to go into. So now ECMWF today produces about a petabyte of data a day when you run simulations. This is what happens if you scale climate simulations up with Moore's law for the last 40 years, um, but your storage doesn't really get cheaper. So you produce more and more data um, because you can simulate faster and faster and faster, but you cannot store that data anymore because you can't afford storing the data. So now somehow you need to compress it. There's something that I just wanted to mention. You can use these deep neural networks. This is a really cool idea. You can use these deep neural networks to compress data by overfitting the data to the network, which is every machine learning person immediately cringes. It's like, nah, you don't want to do this. You don't want to overfit. But it's a wonderful way to compress data into the weights of a network. And then you use the network itself to predict the data. So it's now data as a function. Right? The network implements a function. Now you hammer the function, you know, the data into this function, and then you get it back up. So we have done this uh, with climate data. So it's a bit more of a complicated thing. I don't want to go too much into details. It's a very, very simple network. But the result we get is actually quite amazing. So, so we get uh, 3,000x. Now we are at 10,000x compression ratio at 0.2% uh, uh, loss. So you can actually quite effectively learn this data. And all the, the, the nice uh, other compressors are significantly slow. I mean, significantly less uh, compressing, so one order of magnitude, and also have more, um, uh, more artifacts. So, so the state-of-the-art compression method here, it's actually SC3, which you see there is about 400x compression. What they do is they enforce extremely strict error bounds. So this Frank Capello's work from, uh, from Argon. So they basically say, well, we do not allow errors more than um, whatever. <laughs> and they achieve a 358x compression ratio. We allow some more errors um, because we are mostly worried about, uh, about the uh, predictive quality of the network itself, uh, not about strict error bounds. And now we can look at some results. So you get much higher compression ratio, as you see here. This is geopotential uh, compression ratio uh, goes up to the, the 10,000, as I mentioned. But if you actually look at pictures, this is what the climate scientists usually do. Um, it's very hard to get a, a really clear loss function out of them. They will actually tell you that, uh, well, you need to look at the pictures and then you'll see it. Just true, because if you compare the reference system here, uh, 1x compression to ours, uh, 1000x, then in SD3, you, leave, you see a lot of artifacts. So, and that is uh, ours is kind of the smooth curve 
which is the same as people use for predicting whether we're just overfitting the data into the model. Um, but but do, do you think if there were like more out of, you know, small features in your reference data set, would which method? Do exactly, you, that yeah. comes right now. Okay, so hold, 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 your, hold your thought. This is not all great. This is not all gold that is looking good. Let's now look at a different example. So, so this is, in fact, um, extreme events. Uh, so there's Hurricane Matthew um, that, that some of you may remember. It was with the Caribbean and then hit Florida. Um, so it looks like this in the reference. Our network basically eats it. <laughs> and SC3 maintains it. Okay, so, so that's now an interesting one. And of course, we all know this hurricane uh, caused a lot of, uh, a lot of issues, uh, 600 dead people, a couple of billions in, in uh, fatalities. So this is the open challenge. We can compress a lot, but extreme events are dampened because they're, they're smooth now. So there's something we're working on right now. Okay, so really, this was a long motivation, uh, but really what I wanted to say, large-scale AI training is the future of large-scale computing. Like, this is something that we have to address as a community. We are the HPC community. We are equipped to help these people. Um, so now we're proposing a principled approach to large-scale AI training. What does that mean? Well, if you look at these models, they have three components that you need to make them uh, succeed. And so this is Bird in the top corner because the first model was called Bird Bidirectional Encoder Representation uh, for Transformers. Um, so they need I.O. Um, they do need high-performance compute and they do need high performance communication because you're usually in very large distributed systems. Right? So I'll give you a quick overview of all of these three areas. So in the next couple of minutes, I'm summarizing about 40 papers. Uh, so as I'm saying, I have 16 hours of material. I mean, um, compression is quite good. Exactly, too, yeah. compression. <laughs> <laughs> so, so if you have any questions about anything, something that particularly interests you, I can go again into arbitrary detail, but I want to give you a little bit of the breadth of the overview, what is happening in that field such that you can uh, kind of put things in perspective, right? Okay, so first one, high performance I.O. Um, high performance I.O. is actually not so interesting for large language models. Large language models consume text. Text is super small, <laughs> nobody cares. That's no, you don't need I.O. Uh, you do need I.O., but very limited. However, uh, climate data, I just mentioned like petabytes of data needs a lot of I.O. Um, image data, a lot of I.O. Images are very in, um, imprecise, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, inefficiently stored, like lots of pixels, typically megabytes of data. So I just give you an example here for ResNet. Um, so ResNet 50 is a, is a network for image uh, recognition. You may have heard about it. Um, so it has about 3.x gigaflop uh, inference. So you need that many um, flop operations to, to do it, and three times that many for training. So now if you look at ImageNet, it's 150 gigabytes, so 1.3 million images. Uh, you see the average size is there. If you now look at a specific machine, H100, kind of the modern uh, GPU that you could buy today if you're very lucky and have a lot of money, um, then you would get uh, about 81,000 samples per second out of this uh, data set, which means you need 9.3 gigabyte per second reading of the data. Um, now you know this is kind of random access because it's called stochastic gradient descent in training. Stochastic means random. Um, so you need about 50 SSDs to feed a single GPU of these guys. Okay, that's bad. Um, so now you need a trick. Um, and actually scientific computing gets just worse because this is ImageNet. Image. Uh, climate data gets worse. Uh, we have huge trouble with this. So if you now run training on thousands of GPUs, you need tens of thousands of SSDs to just supply the data to the GPU. Um, nobody usually thinks about it. We all know supercomputers are extremely great at I.O. right now. It's totally suck usually. Um, so on a supercomputer, that is the biggest problem if you want to train. In fact, um, on the computers I have had access to, we lost access to one of those machines because we, we trained models like this and they told us every time we launch it, the file system goes down. We don't want you people on our system. Go away. <laughs> um, it was literally what happened. It was a luster file system. Um, so, so here you have all these wonderful file systems that you could use and adapt to this new workload. Random access, lots of data, tens of gigabytes per second throughput. Um, but actually, um, do we need this? Because in deep learning, I mentioned it's stochastic gradient that's descent. But actually in computers, there is no good source of stochasticity anyway. So all stochast stochastic sources we have are pseudo-random generators. Uh, pseudo random number generators. So we feed some kind of initial uh, salt into it, and then they go with a sequence. And the sequence looks pseudo random, but it's actually pseudo random, it's not really random. What does that mean? Uh, if we take advantage of the fact that we know that the sequence is not really random, it only looks pseudo random, we can predict the future. We can run the sequence ahead until the end of time, and we will know all the accesses that are coming. 
That's one key insight that uh, we call the Laroyan prefetching. So we can basically just pre-compute the sequence, uh, and we can just fetch all the data we will need in the future and stage them into memory. Right. So, so that's that's a trick. Uh, the trick works really well, um, and we call this a near optimal prefetching system, or no pun intended, no PFS. <laughs> My student was very proud of this uh, abbreviation. Um, so, Laroyan prefetching. How does it work? Basically, now no PFS on ops. Uh, works as a distributed cache, right? So, so you, you can predict all the future accesses. You just put them in, and you actually see that some images are accessed more than once. Um, so some examples are actually accessed 18 times because it's random, right? So you may be drawing the same number over and over again. And so what we do, it's very, very, very simple. Uh, so we look at the distribution. We make sure that in local storage, we kind of cache the ones that will be accessed again in the future because we have clairvoyant prefetching. We can <laughs> solve the... Um, the caching problem to 100% accuracy, um, that is all fine. Uh, we actually do this, and then we get a lot of great uh, results on a system that's been signed. Um, so we get extremely high speed ups. I don't want to go too much into detail. We compare to PyTorch, and we compare to PyTorch Plus Daily, which is an NVIDIA data loader, and our NOFs is on the right side. Um, to summarize, we get about 100x reduction in variability of, of input data uh, reading, which is pretty clear because you can now prefetch it like half, a, half an hour before uh, it's good. Uh, so no magic on the Lusten system. A little more, we see the same on the Lusten system. Even scales further. So here we go six GPUs. There we go to a thousand GPUs, and then we get 150x speed up with that with that scheme. So if you ever want to train large scientific data sets, keep that in mind. You can totally pre-compute <laughs> your your access. Um, very 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 powerful idea if you're IO limited, which basically everybody is. Um, so at the end, the epoch runtime gets about four, uh, four uh, five times faster on the lesson system, like the total uh, walk log time for training uh, network. So that's quite nice um, at large scale. Okay, that's it about high performance I/O because I consider I/O soft at this point. Um, th this insight will basically enable you to to run every workload that I would be familiar with. High performance computing uh, for deep learning workloads is a bit more complicated. Um, so what does that mean? So now somehow we need to optimize these transformer networks. If you look at the details of this transformer network, they're actually not super simple, also not super complicated. They're somewhere in between. <laughs> they, they have these, these, um, these blocks here. Each of these blocks basically a function, and, and each of these arrows is a data flow uh, between those, uh, those functions. So it's not, it's, it's not a circuit, but you can implement it as a circuit if you want. In fact, that, that is actually a circuit representation. Um, so, you have this $175 billion thing, uh, sorry, 175 billion parameter thing. On average, to train these models, at the time when we did it in 2019, it costed $12 million to train. Just train it. Just the depreciation of the GPUs and the energy going into the thing was about $12 million per piece um, per training. In fact, GPT-3 had a buck. If you look at the original GPT-3 paper, they said, oh, we had a bug. We had some data leakage that shouldn't be in there, but they could not afford to retrain it, so they had to work around the bug in the model. Right? And the model is the set of parameters, basically the 700 gigabyte that I mentioned. Uh, and nobody, there's no way to debug those anyway, <laughs> because it's like 700 gigabyte of data. What do you do? Uh, well, I don't know. Um, it, the, the observation, the observation is just it works. So now, if you just look at the the uh, breakdown of what this model does, it has. 99.8% of the flops in tensor contractions, which is basically matrix multiplication. Greetings to Jack. So he made sure our systems are extremely good for this. So this is Limpack, <laughs> matrix multiplication, with smaller data types, albeit. So it's, it's not 64-bit, it's 32-bit, or actually 16 bits today. But 99.8%, great, so it's, it's a flop problem. <laughs> We're done. Unfortunately, uh, the remaining 0.2%, which is kind of silly stuff, uh, it's like applying nonlinearities and this, this multi-headed tension, like this, this softmax in here, like nearly no flops at all, but they eat 40% of your runtime. <laughs> so that's now a problem, right? Because this, the tensor contraction is highly optimized, to optimize the heck out of it, but now the other thing, due to Amdahl's law, now dominates, or not, doesn't really dominate, but takes 40% of your runtime, right? So that's bad. Um, what we figured out is that actually everybody has been optimizing these tensor contractions. Uh, great idea at the time. But if you now optimize the data movement, because these things are data movement limited, they don't do any computation, they just shuffle data. Um, if you optimize data movement, you can get a significant speed up. So in fact, we get a, an 8% speed up over deep speed, which is Microsoft's manually tuned, like a team of engineers sitting there uh, because they spent a lot of money <laughs> on this. Um, and, and 
using that uh, piece. But now they're using our implementation. So it's all the ideas from our implementation. They, of course, we implemented it. Um, but that was quite nice. And the idea here was really focus on data movement. Don't, don't worry about flops. Optimize just the flow of the data through the accelerator. That was all in the, on the V100 GPU at the time. It works similarly on A100, which would save us about $3.6 million for the single training run <laughs> for, uh, for a, a model. Like you can see these numbers are quite big. Um, OK, so how did, how, we, how did we do it? It's quite complex in the details, but I'll give you a kind of an overview. We take the same model that I've just shown you on the previous slide. Uh, we break it down into Einstein summation. These are all Einstein summation uh, things. In case you don't know what that is, it's basically a fancy way to write matrix multiplications with a lot of uh, on various indices because they basically have a five-dimensional tensor and they do matrix multiplication in different directions at the time. So it's not always the same, but it's it's quite simple. It's just a lot of that stuff. So we write it down like this. Um, then we use our data-centric uh, framework, which is called DACE, which is uh, what you mentioned at uh, the uh, the Gordon Bell Prize, like we got it uh, with days at the time. And then we, we run automatically, automatically is the key here, with different data layouts on the GPU, as well as different fusion strategies on the GPU. So we generate a lot of code and we actually do auto tuning for, these, for this implementation. This is what the engineers couldn't do. Then we have a global configuration selection graph, actually tens of millions of, of configurations we try. You can try them relatively quickly um, because you just need one run and you see which ones are good and bad. Um, and then, we spit out the optimal data layout and the optimal fusion strategies. Something actually quite straightforward to do, um, but doing it is not that simple because you have all this mess around here. So now it's all automated. So you can basically do it with any machine learning model, even though only transformers kind of matter in practice today. So, um, so for the full bird thing, we get these speed up numbers. As I mentioned, thirty percent over PyTorch, um, eight percent over the fastest hand tuned version that we could find at the time. So that is uh, quite nice, but again, the insight is relatively simple. You just auto tune the heck out of it. You make sure that you go through all different data layouts and all different fusion strategies. Um, so now it turns out that moving data is most expensive on these accelerators. In fact, if you talk to the architects, um, moving data is also blocking the tensor units themselves. So it's not about the computation, it's about getting the data in and out. And if you, if you talk to uh, people working with tensor units, marshalling the data that tensor unit can actually ingest one a cycle is a, a huge art uh, getting the data into the place. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about techniques to shrink this data. Uh, because as I mentioned, it cannot be that dense matrices are the best representation for uh, these weights. That, that sounds unreasonable because our brain is not very dense. Our brain is quite sparse, but I'll get to this in a couple of minutes. So. Now let's first do quantization. I've already mentioned that at the beginning people used 32 bits. Nobody ever used 64 bits for deep learning. That, that, that would be plain silly. Uh, people used 32 bits and now we're going to 16 bits. We are in fact going to eight bits. We are probably going to four bit. Um, and then you can argue what does a four bit floating point number even mean because you need one bit for the sign that you have maybe one or two left. So you need one for the Matissa range. one or zero. You have one or two bit left for the exponent. So it's kind of a funny number. In fact, the things work there. We have quantized models down to 2.5 bits on average, or 2.3 bits. And so these models still work. Right? So in fact, our brain um, has very, very limited precision. I don't have it here on the slide. Think for yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> my, brain, my brain has <laughs> limited precision. So, so my brain can, can only differentiate 24 different voltage levels. How many bits is that? About four. So about four bits of precision is what my brain works with. I mean, Bob's brain is probably at five or six bits, <laughs> not at 32, though. <laughs> so why do we use FP32 for this training still today uh, sometimes? Well, technical reasons. SGD sucks. I mean, I could give a whole two-hour lecture about why stochastic gradient descent is not a great idea. However, it's one of those things that just works in practice. We know that it works. We have no real alternative. I have spent at least a year looking at alternatives. I have not found any that actually worked in practice, so we are working with SGD. Let me explain a little bit what the problem is of SGD. Oh, here I have it. Um, so we, we have these 24 levels that I just mentioned. Um, so now GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters. Um, again, I mentioned this before, still 350 gigabytes in, in FP16. You probably know about uh, Google's brain float 16, where they basically said, well, the precision doesn't matter anyway, but we need dynamic range. So they pumped up the exponent a little bit and reduced the Matissa a little bit, um, but it's still, still the same floating point number. Um, rounding to less than five bits, actually rounding to five bits is simple in these models. You can just round your number to five bits and it'll, it'll perform reasonably well. 
rounding to less than five bits gets very tricky. And I will give you a little bit of an idea of what tricky means and how we get around tricky. I mentioned we got down to 2.3 bits, and I'll give you a, a rough idea how we do this. And it is, it is related to SGD. So SGD is an, an optimization method. So it's, it's very, very straightforward, simple optimization. It's stochastic gradient descent. Forget the stochastic. Stochastic basically just means that I'm, I'm picking random uh, subsets of my mini batch. So it's, it's, it's relatively simple to just uh, orthogonalize out. Um, but now gradient descent. Right? So now let's say we have the loss density. We have one parameter in this one over one. Only one parameter. Okay? This, this I can still draw. And then we have a loss function. So basically. That's, that's the function I mentioned on the very second slide, if you remember. Um, that is the knot. You need to predict the knot. Right? So that the loss function tells you how far you're away from the real data that you actually wanted, uh, the real result you want. So now I'm starting at a random initialization of my parameter x1. Right? That's important. I, I, I do not know how it looks like when I start. So, I, uh, so some initialization schemes, they usually normalize, but at the end, they're all random. So I, I, let's say I pick this point here. Right? What does SGD do? SGD, or oh, GD, uh, gradient descent. Gradient descent descends with the gradient, right? So at this point, you compute the gradient. Uh, the gradient shows down, and you go down. If you start here, you, you go this way, right? Problem is, if you start here, you get to a better solution than if you start here. Pretty clear. I mean, that's what the gradient descent does. And so now, when you have a trained model, a trained model, uh, you train it until the gradient is nearly zero. So you are in one of those local minima. So you start with the random thing you train down. So now if you look at the uh, Taylor expansion of the loss function, so this, this loss function, you can actually have three different pieces of this loss function. As you know, it's just a Taylor expansion. So it's, it's, uh, I'm assuming you're familiar with Taylor expansions, right? There's a first order term uh, that is the gradient uh, that is typically zero if you're down here, right? I think that's okay, people are nodding good. Um, then there's a second order, there's, there's a higher order term, a third order that we don't care about because we just assume the third order is, is so far away that, that it doesn't matter. I know, I know some people look like that. Um, but then there's the curvature, right? So it's basically how, how stiff is this function here at this point where I'm sitting? And that is incredibly important um, because now if you, if I may add a second parameter, well, the first one's not so easily visible. Um, so if I have a second parameter, it's now loss landscape. So the, the this is the minimum in the middle and, and this it's like, it's a well, right? And now if we start, oh, oh, I'm missing part of my animation. Oh. Okay, no, no, this is actually, I don't want to go into too much detail, but I can give you, a, uh, because I've only 13 minutes left, a lot of, uh, lot of fun. Um, but the idea is if I use the second order term, I can in fact solve an equation if I have a second order loss to optimality that gives me the result for the best quantization. So I know for each number if I'm rounding up or down. I can compute that analytically. And I can bound the error and push the error forward. This is a bit more complicated, probably needs 45 minutes to explain. Um, but I just want to tell you that this exists. So you can use strong math uh, to actually optimize these models. This is very important because most people do it very empirically. Um, so they just rather and see what's happening. Um, so you can actually do this uh, quite founded. So now what we did is we used um, these large language models that I mentioned. Uh, this is, uh, these are, uh, th this paper basically uses the blue language model, which is a 175 billion parameter model. And it uses uh, another, and I forgot the name, uh, another 175 billion parameter model. We cannot use GPT-3 or GPT-4 because as I mentioned, these parameters are worth gold. Uh, so some people have trained open source models that are performing similarly, but not as good. <laughs> um, and those you can just download, essentially. You may have heard about the Llama model, but the Llama model is tiny compared to those models. Um, so what did we do? We solved this objective function here that I can't go much into detail, but it's really just a second order uh, solver. However, if you run a second order solver on 175 billion numbers, uh, that is also a challenge. That's not super simple because as you know, second order requires number of parameters times number of parameters. Now do 175 billion times 175 billion, and then you have your actual dimensionality of the problem you're working in. <laughs> so huge, huge, huge. Um, so we have a lot of approximations tricks. So we, we update the Hessian, which is this, this n by n matrix, uh, only for each column. Uh, we, we push it forward as we go forward. So, so lots of tricks. Um, even more tricks here um, that I don't want to go into detail. But what comes out of it is that we easily get down to three bits, which is now only 66 gigabyte for these parameters. Still sounds a lot, but it's kind of reasonable to push this into a cell phone now, um, like an expensive cell phone. <laughs> so, um, but we can run it on a single A100 GB. 
And, and in fact, the latest result that we just submitted uh, a week ago, we go down further down to 2. Point something bits that really runs on an Apple cell phone. So it's so your language model. Um, and the generative inference is also two to four times faster because we, we reduce the data movement. Obviously, if you compress data, you move less. So that's, that's, there is no magic. Yes? So, so. Correct. Great. So, so with what, what we do is we load the data in three bits, uh, and then we cast it up. Okay. In, right in the registers, we, we just expand it, uh, which is also a bit tricky because we still need every cycle we need to feed in <laughs> into the Tetzel unit, uh, but we've managed to actually get this done, yes. Um, hopefully soon in the future, devices will have three-bit ALUs and, and two-bit ALUs. Um, because actually this whole thing, I'll hold your thought on a second, uh, this whole thing, you can implement as a circuit. See, it's really cool because of what uh, two bit arithmetic is very, very cheap. Right. So, so that's something to consider. Yes. Hey, absolutely. Yes, yes, absolutely. The, uh, I was probably too fast on the previous slide. The, the idea is that we work on the already optimized model. So, so Adam and, and all of these things, they guide the optimization process itself to, to go through, I mean, to basically jump through something and get a little bit better. But we assume we are already trained. So we are already stuck in this, in this local minima. We, we don't change the minima. We don't go anywhere else. We just try to compress the parameters to get us to stay at the same minima. Because when we compress it, we move it a little bit in this high dimensional space, 175 billion dimensional space. <laughs> it's always something to remember. And this shakes a little bit. Um, so we try to keep the difference minimal. Okay, there are lots of more tricks. Actually, this requires a lot of tricks to work, um, but but it does. And now the good news is quantization we get down by an order of magnitude. Right? So that's basically what I just showed. So 32 bits to about three bits. Uh, great. Um, can we go further? Because an order of magnitude is not enough. Right, right now uh, these models are still too big. Um, there is one thing that we are also working on: is sparsification. The brain is not a dense matrix unit. Just yes. a question before that. Absolutely. Uh, about the quantization, uh, we don't, have, we don't, for example, we don't have problem for decreasing model performances because we can, where, for example, have detailed information. For example, when working with, the, uh, for example, with flow, for example, with precision data. So, with using quantization, we don't have problem with precision for the models. Mm. Yeah. So, for example, when we're working about a model. With the important precision, for example, of five number, for example, which is quantization, will have this type of problem. Sensibility of the model will be a little bit. Uh... We we found that that you can easily go to four bit, and and the the the, the value function, the accuracy function of the model is, is is very complicated. How do you evaluate what the model is good at? Right, you can talk to it and, and figure out if, if you like what it says or not. Uh, then there is some functions called perplexity. Uh, which is basically how accurate it is to predict the next word that you feed in, like this is how it's trained. Um, and in, in all of those metrics, and there are various tasks as well, like the glue task, general language understanding uh, tasks, and I don't know what, in these tasks, we lose less uh, than 1% accuracy. And, and actually from manual, uh, talking to the model, it still behaves like the original model. I couldn't tell the difference. Um, so, so, but the problem is, it's not math, right? I mean, language generation, is not mathematical. So you, the loss function is very subjective. Right? You have to figure out if you like it or not. So we found it's people like it. Um, and it's also it's published at top best venues like that there in, in ICML. So at least the reviewers found <laughs> that, that this also works. Um, does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Then you can sparsify. Rain is not sparse. Rain is, in fact, only 20% dense. It's, it's more than I thought, when I looked up, but, but we have about 20% density in our brain. Um, so why do we do this? Um, why is it uh, not? Yeah, OK, let me, let me not go into too much details here. And the intuition is also clear. Um, you, don't, you don't need all features to make predictions. And this is very simple. As an example, you can read the sentence. Um, and it's missing about 30% of the letters. Uh, everybody in this room will totally understand what it means. Um, so why do we do? Uh, why do we not do this in a deep learning model? Well, in fact, we do. I mean, we can just remove some neurons and some weights, and then we all have. Um, this is a bit more complicated than quantization. In fact, a bit more as much more complicated than quantization. Um, so this is why it's not uh, super successfully used in practice. However, in research, um, we have about we have two results. We can basically get rid of 95% of the parameters and still get good output. So for, for BERT and ResNet style models. And now your question may be, well, if I'm already rounding, is that impacting my ability to specify? Not too much to my surprise. 
uh, which I found extremely surprising. Yeah. So they work together well. How do you decide which edges to drop? Yeah, exactly. How do we decide which? That is the next slide. Um, so actually, uh, deciding which edges to drop, this is an interesting question. I spent my COVID time reading 450 papers, uh, well, about 450 papers, that, that for exactly on that topic, which edges to drop. Um, super complicated field. I just give you an overview. So what can you sparsify? You can sparsify the model. You can sparsify the weights in the model. These are the edges. Uh, and weight is an edge. Um, you can sparsify full neurons. This is basically a full row or a column of the matrix, like lots of edges go immediately. You can sparsify full structures, like full filters, full heads and transformers, so, and get rid of very large things. Um, you can sparsify the weights in an unstructured way or in a structured way. Right? You can sparsify arbitrary, uh, remove arbitrary weights, then you have a, a, an arbitrary matrix, or you can you remove blocks of weights, then you have less overhead to store which ones you've removed. <laughs> Um, you can, I mean, this is called structural sparsity. The left thing is called unstructured sparsity, right? So this is just a lot. And then actually there's more. <laughs> you can also have ephemeral sparsity. These are as your values are flying through your, uh, through your network, you can also drop some of those values. Um, and, and this is why it's ephemeral. This is for each example, you have different values. This is the, the fixed structures. Um, so now dropout, uh, many of you may have heard about dropout. That's, that's a standard technique. You just say, well, at the end of the, of, of the layer, I'm just dropping 10% of my weights randomly. Uh, sorry, 10% of my activations uh, randomly set them to zero. Uh, this works really well as a regularizer. It's also a form of sparsity. Oh, there's many more. Uh, you activation sparsity, like if you use reloops, it rounds to zero, so it's another a sparsifier. So sparsity is super important to get good results, actually. That is, sparsity creates data in these networks. Very interesting insight in my view. You can sparsify gradients, you can sparsify arrows, you can sparsify optimized state, you can sparsify anything. People have worked on everything. Uh, this is 400 something papers. And this is the big thing, conditional computation. This is Google's next big thing. If you look at uh, Jeff Dean's presentations, um, they, they call uh, like the whole palm model, path the pathways uh, language model. The funny thing is the pathways architecture is all about conditional computation. The palm language model, literally palm means pathways language model, has none of those. <laughs> and I asked the architects and they were like, yeah, and sparks. Um, yes. Uh, so interesting. Yes. We have one more vector. Yes. So, I, I, yes, I mean, only this is right. Everything else is not random. Um, but I don't want to answer that question because that'll eat the remaining talk, uh, part of my talk. I have a two hour talk on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> into that detail. There's also the longest JMLR paper. JMLR is a top class journal in machine learning. The longest paper ever accepted is this paper. <laughs> so that was, uh, it's about uh, 90 pages. <laughs> and, and there's this two hour talk on how to exactly do sparse application. I, I just wanted to mention that if you're interested, you should look at it. Um, this, this video is like my, my hit video, it's like 10,000 views or so. Um, yeah, I'm not a YouTube star. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, just one example. Like you, you asked for magnitude-based pruning, what can you do? Well, you can actually remove the weights with the smallest absolute magnitude. It's the, the, the trivial, most trivial thing you can do, right? So if you actually look at the dense network, uh, this is a resonant network, the weights look like this, they're all distributed around minus 0 0.06 or whatever, and minus plus 0 0.06, they're Gaussian distributed. Why are the weights Gaussian distributed? That is funny, um, but it is. Uh, there's a weird peak here. Um, what you do with magnitude-based pruning, obviously you, you cut everything that is kind of in the middle, cut the, the smallest magnitudes, right? And then what you do, and then your performance goes down from 76% accuracy to 36% accuracy, not good. But what you do is you just retrain a little bit, <laughs> now with those zero, some of them will fill in and then you go easily back to 71%, just three epochs. And this, you keep doing this. Like you just retrain, retrain, retrain. And now you have already dropped 70% uh, of your parameters. Right. So that, that's how you do it in practice. Like it's one way to do it. There are about 20 different ways to do it. And this is the easiest one. Um, yeah. So then, kind of funny, uh, you, you, you may know scientific computing sparse matrices. They all look like this. They all have a lot of structure, like uh, locality, basically. You see the main diagonal, always, then you have local structures at the, but I don't need to tell you, like Bob especially knows all of this. If you look at, at BERT matrices, 
um, this is again these transformers, as the sparsity dials up, it's a completely random distribution essentially. So there's no structure whatsoever. I mean, you can see a little bit of structure here. You, you see these rows forming. Right? You see there, there's a little bit coming, uh, though, sorry, columns. There's a little bit of a column structure coming for higher sparsity. This is actually what we exploit in our latest paper, but it's very weak, it's a very weak signal. Um, so kind of uh, kind of interesting insight. So they're very different from, deep, uh, from the scientific computing matrices that we have been using for the last decades. So what this means is we basically need a different programming model for those because CSR is a bad idea. You don't want to store those in CSR, but let me just skip that part because I want to get to the last one. Uh, we, we of course have this all implemented, blah, 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 uh, works great. Uh, you can, you, you can run this, you, you, get, uh, you, you, you get actually high performance, blah, blah, blah. So here, just to get the performance dense, it's about 58 milliseconds here at 90% sparsity, we get to 44. It's, like, it's not an order of magnitude. Um, and this is, this is on an Intel CPU. It's just that these Intel CPUs are particularly bad at, uh, for, for this kind of uh, processing. I'm expecting that you can get easily an order of magnitude speed up if you build a specialized architecture for these. And guess what? I am involved in startups <laughs> building a lot of specialized architectures for exactly that stuff. Um, so if you run on the standard CPU, you won't see that much. By the way, TensorForce today have this two to four sparsity, which is exactly aiming at that. But of course, it only gives you 50% sparsity here. The very left is 50% has at most speed up of two. You, of course, lose half of it. So you have speed up of 20% at the end. It's okay. We have some papers on how to do it, but, but they're limited. So now, what is the new bottleneck as we are going? And I think I have to skip the full uh, remainder of the talk, but I'll just get you motivated. Um, what is the new bottleneck? Well, if you do a back of the envelope calculation now, we have quantized FP32 to FP. We have reduced the data movement by three, uh, by four X. Computational speed up is actually 32 X um, because multipliers are square <laughs> in size. Um, so as far as I find, we get a 50% gain. That's a lower trend, so it's not that much. So we reduce each by 2x. Um, now, if you look at the data movement cost and the compute cost, it's already kind of uh, the same order of magnitude. This is a constant here, this m, this is your you know, cache size. Um, so somehow, the data movement ratio of the flops per byte reduced significantly. So these future accelerators that we're building to accelerate this workload will have problems, even more problems than we have today with data movement. And it, today we already have a lot of problems going much worse. And this motivates kind of the second part of the talk, um, but I will skip it, no worries. I can go uh, quickly. So network, um, we really need to worry about the network. Actually these devices, they need so much connectivity. It's, it's completely crazy. It is literally crazy. This is this is much of what I, I am doing, and I did at Microsoft. I actually, think the the, um, the the acceleration is kind of it's done. We know how to do it. I, the part I talked about here is, is I fully understand everything. I, I know how to do it. Uh, the network thing is it's unclear how to deliver the network bandwidth you need for these things. Um, I can should I give you a bit of an overview, or yeah, I mean, the time is over, I suppose. Right? Yeah, that's so maybe three minutes overview, and then. We'll go for questions. I'll, I'll give the three minutes over you, exactly. So the nice thing is if you now parallelize these systems, you have three dimensions that you parallelize in. And the, the, the first dimension is, is the mini batch dimension. Um, so you have a lot of data, as I mentioned at the beginning, right? You feed in pages of pages of pages of text, or books of books of books of text. Um, and how do you do it? Well, you have one mini so-called mini batch, which is the, the, the units of things that you feed into the model before you update the weights. Right? Um, so that's one iteration, what they sometimes call it. So there's a lot of data. And what you do is you cut this data into multiple pieces here, in this case, three pieces, feed it through three different copies of your full model, and, and then, then you're happy. Right? On the way back, you just sum, uh, do an all reduce, and you sum all the weights, and then you just apply them locally. Super easy to do. This is what everybody does. The problem is, I already mentioned, that each of these models here is 700 gigabyte in size. <laughs> so I don't have an accelerator that fits 700 gigabyte of data. So I have an accelerator that fits like 40 gigabyte. If, I, if I'm poor, I have a 32 gigabyte or 60 gigabyte uh, accelerator memory. Uh, so which means I actually need to distribute each of those models. Okay, so, so what I'm doing here in pipeline parallelism, this is super interesting. I'm, I'm taking, I, I already mentioned there are 96 layers in each transformer. And I can take as small as one layer or even smaller than a layer and put these on different accelerators. So layer one, layer two, layer three, um, yeah, this is a special layer. This, this is just the, uh, the final one, but it doesn't matter. And then, of course, if you know anything about pipelining, I have solved the memory problem. 
I have now distributed these things, and now, now my data goes in first accelerator, second accelerator, third accelerator. The latency doesn't go down. Actually, it goes up. <laughs> my throughput goes up. I, I can feed more data, but still the customer at the end, and this is very important for the company that I'm helping, the customer at the end is waiting a whole long time. And if you've used these models, you know they're super slow. Um, but So this is not sufficient. How do you get the model itself? Like, how do you get the latency down? You know, take each of those operators and split those across multiple accelerators again. Right? And then you actually get the latency down. So, so pipeline parallelism, you only use in order to fit the model in the freaking accelerator. It doesn't get you much, uh, but you need it. And the operator parallelism then gets you the actual speed up. But operator is super mega expensive because this is distributed matrix multiplication. And we all know you don't want to do distributed matrix multiplication. So that's kind of the overview. And, and I think I'll, I'll skip the remainder. Um, there is a lot of stuff. Coming. Thank you so much, Justin. To in person, you can ask a question, and online, just unmute yourself and. <clears throat> I, so, out of curiosity, so do you have analyzed the trade-off if you do specification first, quantization second, or vice versa? So, is there an analysis there? Yes, yes. So we have analyzed. I mean, people, not, not, not us, but, but people have looked at this, especially Qualcomm. So Qualcomm is big time into, into combining the two. They have this paper that they work well together. It actually turns out that, that if you sequentialize them, it's kind of a bad idea. What you want to do is you want to solve the problem together for both at the same time. Because both can take advantage of the mathematical formulation that I showed you with the second order curvature. They're kind of both a similar thing. And this is why uh, the paper that I showed was, was called, uh, I mean, the, the paper that I talked about that was not on the slides, uh, is actually combining the two in the same step. Um, so when you, when you determine your rounding and you determine your sparsification, you better do it together. Okay. That gets you a huge boost. Yeah, because I thought it was separate, one, one after the other. You, you can, you can yeah. do them separate, but it's with, as with any optimization problem, like if you first, opt, I mean, multi uh, tested optimization problem, if you first optimize, Objective A and then objective B, the joint optimization is very often better. And it's the same here. Um, I wouldn't, I haven't seen a difference in the literature. I haven't tried it myself between first sparsification and then quantization, or first quantization and sparsification. It's really the suggestion is to do it together. Okay, okay. thank you. And you solve the same equations, which is quite cool. Actually. So you save a lot of compute as well. Okay. And you have a question? <laughs> Online. <clears throat> so, so um, okay. I think you, you blew our minds basically. So, um, there was a question. So, um, when you're doing the compression of uh, parameters, then you're potentially ending up with like a Suboptimal model, like language model, right? Is there a um, standardized or a benchmark way to uh, to assess the performance across these models? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly why I was asking you to answer your question. Um, yes, there are. There are many standardized ways, which means there's no standard. Um, so, for example, GLU as this general language understanding uh, benchmark is, is one that people keep referring to. Um, there are a ton of these, there's about a hundred different benchmarks for, for kind of communication with humans. Um, some of them are not very good. Uh, they don't give you a lot of differentiation. Some are good. Um, there's really a long list. And if you look at, for example, the GPT-3 paper, uh, how did they establish that GPT-3 is better than GPT-2? Well, they, they picked, I think, 17 out of this 100. Um, and, and then they just show all the data for the 17. There's no single number that they have to at the end. Um, and there's a lot of examples as well. What we typically do in the papers, we show, oh, if I'm using that prompt, uh, you get that result. If I'm rounding the model, I use that prompt, I, I get that result. And it turns out they're actually super similar. Um, but we wish there was a clear metric. <laughs> okay. And the only clear number I would give is perplexity, which is really the, the training loss of the model essentially, right? So this is with, with what confidence am I producing the right next bar, as I mentioned at the very beginning. But that has not, it's, it's okay, but it doesn't have a very high correlation with the actual conceptual questions that humans are asking the model, right? Because sometimes 
uh, words are very, have very, uh, represent very similar concepts. And I didn't go into details of how this actually works that if I'm training on a lot of words, the model gets to concepts because you can ask it conceptual questions. Like, like uh, I don't know, um, like bird or uh, two different bird types that they're still the, the same bird category of, of Ford and, and Mazda, both are cars. Um, and that is a more complicated process. Because if I'm talking about a car, if I'm asking a question about a car, it's not so important that I get the right exact brand of the car for most contexts. And this is where the human perception is very different from this kind of perplexity metric, uh, because perplexity would insist on the right model of which I, uh, most people don't care. This is also why these models hallucinate. Um, they kind of make stuff up um, because it's kind of close in their, in their universe. And it's all a vector space, right? So, so it's really just a vector space. And, and the quality of the vector space can be measured by exact match. I now have a better explanation, which is perplexity, mm -hmm. or by more conceptual questions, which is now proximity. Right? And, and it's really hard to measure proximity. If you find anything, please let me know. This is the major uh, uh, problem I have with this field. I, I don't. There's no clear loss function. Actually, in climate science, it's the same. There's no clear loss function. You always look at these pictures and say, "Oh, this looks close." <laughs> Really a disaster for learning. Yes, so it's just when we talking about, for example, it's from a hardware perspective. So when we talk about quantization, for example, for example, if I got this this solution and I implement it at the edge yeah. level, you don't think that we still have a resource problem, our hardware problem, because we need all the time GPU to be the co-design between the quantization and the edge. Uh, resources it's not uh, it's not it's not enough for example what we do with quantization it's not enough in in at the edge so we we don't have we have to add new resources like we say that we bring resources to edge instead to develop a new approaches with less consumption of resources what do you think about it? um i think you should do both <laughs> i think it's super important to get resources into the edge uh, especially with these models um, because you have them anyway, and the data center is just longer latency. I mean, you have the workload anyway, the data center is just longer latency away. Um, so why would you not do parts of it at least in the edge? But then, you all, I mean, whether it's in the data center or in the edge, you, you want to have efficient compute. Could not imagine uh, what, the, what the cost and the workload is for the services that the mega data centers are providing right now. And just if you look at ChatGPT and the new Bing, I can't give you numbers, but it is, it is very, very expensive. And so getting that in order of magnitude down is, is but it doesn't matter where it's located. You know? yeah, for example, for smartphones, we have to add, for example, GPU on smartphones, but there is a lot of problem, for example, with energy, for example, network is, and the user at the same time using this. This is not, it's, do, do you think we can one day, for example, have in a solution like quantization that will be adapted for, the, for example, with less, for example, cons resource consumption? Yeah. But what I can see is what, what many uh, models will do is actually they will probably deploy a low quality version of the model at the edge. And then the model hopefully gets you some kind of certainty, whether it's certain or not. And then for some queries, I have to go to a higher quality version. So for example, Llama, the 13 billion parameter version easily fits my cell phone. I can totally run it on my cell phone. Uh, it's still slow, but I, I can. Uh, these super fat models like GPT 3, 4, uh, I mean, I'm going to wait like a minute for each token to be generated, um, even in the context case. So I think there will be a combination of the two. And this is figuring out how to split the model and, and what to put on the phone along on the edge and what to put at the data center is, is a future work and is an art. I mean, this whole workflow um, happening from the edge to, to, the, to the core of the data center is something that people are figuring out right now. So it's not, not clear, but I think quantization will play a super important, I mean, model compression efficiency plays a super important role in, in, in the whole, like every stage of that workflow. Just cost. All right. Thank you so much, Torsten. Folks online for attending.